there. So uh, today we will share some topic about how we manage data in AI, especially in Kubernetes. Like we will introduce two solutions together. One is the CSI fields, the one that you guys already see in the actual in the schedule, and the other one is a newly come out one. It's called ETCD FS back. The names come kind of a little um, like confusing in the beginning, but I will go through them one by one. So first introduce myself, so I'm Lu. I am the open source PNC maintainer of Alasio, previously named Tai Yang. And I also is the AI platform Tai Li at Alasio. So we will quickly go through the AI data management problems in Kubernetes. And we will introduce the two solutions, the CSI fields and the ETCD FS back. So uh, quickly go through the problems. Like Kubernetes, it how is the deployment headaches. But for data scientists, they still need to consider so many problems, like other than the AI logic. Like where is my data, and why my data is so slow, why it costs so much money, et cetera. Then how can we get away all those storage overhead from data scientists and let them to focus on AI logic more than before? So we'll talk about the first solution, the CSI fields. So first we will uh, talk a little bit about what's fields. Fields have a kind of a magic title. Basically, it can turn your cloud storage into your local file system format. Considering you are open a folder in your local Mac, it may look like just a folder or file in your local file system, but it can be backed by some cloud storage, like S3, like GCS. So it has much bigger capability than your local disk but you can use it just like your local disk. So all the data scientists, they really like this kind of logic. They think that it's wonderful. But everything is not without a cost. So one cost that comes with fuels is that it will need more resources, the CPU, memory, and disk, because it will, use, it will launch some of the kernel threads to help deal with the operations. And also like you will use some of kernel cache and also some disk for local cache performance. So all those come with some resources cost. Then our data science speaker is saying that I only need the fields like the data set which represent it, you are using a fuse pool in my AI chaining logic. If I don't need it, can you just not launch it? So like we, so CSI makes it really good that it can launch the fuse nodes when the data set is needed. So fuse part deal with the storage logic, while application part deal with the AI logic. But CSI maintain the same life cycle between these two, so the fuse part will only be launched when your application need the data set. Everything sounds perfect, but like data scientists consider like have another question like why my data access is so slow. Like as we all know, like assessing cloud storage data is not your local disk speed. But when data scientists, they are assessing your local data, they expect something similar to your local disk performance. Then come up with like, how can we deal with the slow performance? Like one solution is local cache. Like different uh, fuse solution like S3 FS fuse, they have their built-in local cache. You can also use other like GCF fuse, they also have their built-in local cache to solve this problem. But sometimes the AI application, you, you actually need to uh, data to be shuffling and shared between nodes. This comes with the need for distributed caching. So on the uh, left side is the training node. On the right side is the storage system. And we kind of break the logic between the training node and the storage system and like to two parts, sense for fields, which can turn cloud storage into a local folder for your training nodes. And in the middle, we can add another like digital caching layer in between to provide high performance data access. So in this case, you can assess the cloud storage data like the local data, while also enjoy the performance benefit coming from the distributed caching system. And we've done some of the benchmark, like the CV data loading uh, between Alasio and SRS Fuse, and also Boto S3 API. Alasio is five times faster than S3 FS Fuse, and more than 10 times faster when you use Boto 3 S3 API to directly. 
And sometimes like our user will show us some graph like TensorFlow showing like how much data is actually used in data loading and how much time is actually used in the GPU utilization. So the higher the time spent in data loader, it could directly result in a low GPU utilization rate. And with Elastio Fuse solution, we can reduce the data loader rate from 82% to 1%, which directly improve the GPU utilization rate from 17% to 93%. This sounds amazing, but everything comes as a cost, as I mentioned. So there are two problems with Fuse on Kubernetes. The first one is that you actually need to have a separate container for your fuse part because it costs resources and its, its logic is relatively complicated. And on the other part, it needs you to have the system admin security privilege. Many Kubernetes folks talk to me that we don't want to allow you to have the system admin privilege because we don't know what you would do in our cluster. Like we don't want you to ruin the host machine or other things. So these two are actually an overhead for us to maintain fields on Kubernetes. Then we jump to the next solution about ETCD FS back. So first, what is FS back? Any of you guys here heard about FS back? Please raise your hand, please. Oh, there does have some people here, which I'm really surprised. <laughs> Um, and anybody of you have heard about Arrow? Place your hand, please. Oh, much more hands, I can see that. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. So starting from Arrow, Arrow connecting different data format together. You can, change, you can read from one data format in one line in Arrow, and then write the data format to another data format in one line, like basically write from Arrow, write data format. And on the other hand, Arrow has connecting different frameworks together. You can read data from one framework and write it to another framework with only like simple, simply by several lines of code, which makes everything connect together. But when Arrow need to deal with the story system, it will go to FSBack. It basically delegate all the cloud story operations to FSBack. FSBack define the file system interface for Python. And it's kind of learning from the two framework. One is Python IO, and the other one is Fuse that we just mentioned before. But compared to Python IO and Fuse, its interface is much easier. It especially made it so easy for the cloud storage vendor to implement it. So based, for example, if you want to implement a storage system just for read, you only need to implement probably like three APIs, list status, get file status, and, and read range. Basically, that's it. So it's really simple to implement from the engineer perspective. And, so, and also, uh, we have like, different like, FSBack implementation on the market as well, like S3 FS, Azure FS, GCF FS, Hugging Face FS, nearly at all the storage vendor you, you can consider of. Compared to Fuse, it's easy to implement. It's designed for cloud storage. It's easy to use. It does not require Azure container or system admin permission. And talking about performance, it has the same issue that's similar to Fuse. It needs to have some kind of local cache to be able to provide faster data access. And it also is not designed for AI workloads that with data shuffling and sharing logic. So, it turn, so we bring out our cloud native distributed caching system, uh, which is our new generation of distributed caching system that built for Kubernetes. So uh, on the left side is the FS bag, which is the client side. On the right side is the Elastio system cache, which is the servers. And for read, we will first check, okay, whether our data is local. If the data is already cached locally, that's great, we can directly get the data from local. And if not, we will go to the distributed caching service. Then we will need to know, okay, I have so many Elastio workers that probably cache data for me which worker are more likely to have the data cached there so that I can, I can get my data at a faster speed. So it includes some kind of worker selection logic. For to be able to select which worker, we need to get some information of those workers. And those worker membership information is stored in ETCD. ETCD responsible for periodically get the worker list from all the worker basically say hi to the ETCD, and then ETCD provide those membership information to our clients periodically. And based on those worker information, we will create a consistent hash ring. 
and so that we can know that, oh, worker zero is more likely to have the cache data, so we go to worker zero to serve our read request of a certain file. And if anything uh, happened, like if the data is not cached, or if the read goes wrong, if a network have some issue, or if you guys not actually not doing read, you guys want to do write, then all those operations will be go directly, directly to the underlying FS back, like S3 FS, GCS FS, Hugging Face FS. Basically, we add in one layer of ca distributed caching logic on top of the existing UFS, like the S3 GCS, et cetera. And one question that many people may ask is like, is the distributed caching system, then why cloud native? Our Alasio previously have the previous version of Alasio, and when we actually run it in Kubernetes cluster, like many Kubernetes folks like, do complain to us, it's like, we don't want something stable. Why stable? Can we do stateless? Our whole Kubernetes cluster does not allow any stable data system. And that kind of like may us shock because it's a caching system, we think it's a data system, and data need to be sit there like persistently. But consider from other hand, it's a caching system. The data is able to lost just as your kernel cache. The data can be lost, it can be added. So we developed a new uh, system that built for stateless. So like consider some of the workers here, uh, consider you have a, a Kubernetes cluster, many services may share the same cluster. And um, sometimes like the, when the training jobs get higher priority, we want it to give it more catching resources. But sometimes like um, the other jobs get higher priority, we may want to kill the whole Alasio system cache, or we may want to scale it down. Or maybe these several nodes are under maintenance, we want, to we want to move it to other nodes. Then in this case, for this architecture, like you, if you do change to the Alasio system cache, it will affect tem temporarily the cache hit rate. Basically, the newly launched worker, they don't have the previous cache data. And because the caching count shift a little bit, it have a little cache hit missed. So in that case, it affects a little bit of performance. But as time go by, when you re-catch all the data, the performance will catch up. So that's the trade-off that we did for our users. They can decide that where they want to get stable so that the data is more stable, or they want to go stateless so that like, it gives more control to the Kubernetes logic, like scheduler and all other resource management logic. And on the other hand, this architecture is highly fault tolerant and highly available. For all, everything that Chris fought, we basically fall back to the underlying file system. Underlying file system is always the source of truth. Even if the whole Elastic system cache is killed by the Kubernetes cluster, you are still able to serve requests. Basically, all operation will be fall back to the underlying file system. And now we will talk more about like how to use this kind of architecture in the real world. So one example is use Ray with Elastio. So we may talk a little bit about Ray. How many of you guys know Ray? Please raise your hand, please. I can see some similar folks raise hand again, and other folks are, yeah, the same. So uh, Ray is designed for distributed caching. Ray basically use a distributed scheduler to dispatch training jobs to available workers. And it enables the seamless horizontal scaling of training jobs across multi-nodes. And it has a really good part that it can parallel your data loading, data preprocessing, and the training logic. So, par so for example, when you are training on um, like partition two, you can par partition in and partition one, and then loading the partition zero, something like that. So it can do those things parallel to fully utilize your C GPU resources and CPU resources. But uh, it also has some performance and cost implementation of Ray. Because like, for example, when you use Ray with PyTorch, in, when you're doing the AI training, in each Apple, you need to load the whole data set. And it's reusing the whole data set at the cluster level. But on each node level, uh, you will, sorry. <laughs> like, so uh, basically, like for each Apple, you need to reload the whole data set again. Because Roy doesn't tell you to catch the data. It only manage what data is needed to be used by the immediate task. And also, you cannot catch the hottest data among multiple training jobs optimally. 
So basically, you cannot have some data sharing logic. And you might be, might be suffering from a cold start every time. So we go into the race Slack channel and do find some of the user had they about their data reuse problem, especially when they are doing a large amount of data. And so in the framework, it's like uh, in the Ray ecosystem, Ray is the unified compute, the machine learning uh, pipeline orchestration. And it orchestrates like different framework together, like some data preprocessing framework and some of the training and inference framework like PyTorch and TensorFlow. And so it originally directly load data from the remote storage. And Elastio adds as a data, high performance data access layer between the compute layer and the storage system to provide better performance for the compute job. And the usage is also pretty easy. You create the Elastio file system and then you read data using the original S3 URL or original like UFS URL and you say your file system it'll go Elastio. So the usage is quite simple. And by using this framework, especially with the large pocket file, we are able to achieve like two times to five times like better performance compared to same region S3. And it not only uh, uh, improve the performance, but also reduce some of the data transfer costs, like because the data is cached. So originally the large highly concurrent AI workloads, they would directly hit to your storage system. And for your storage system, it may just say that, hey, you guys you see my like, data access rate. You cannot do that much read in that short period of time. And it may just error you out. Or they may say that, oh, we only can give you certain throughput, certain latency. So uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is about the data transport cost, like both in terms of like the cloud storage, like the vendor charts, at when the cost and also like the people that managing the data transfer. And on the other hand, like we found that there are many of the redundant like API calls, like the S3 operation for list status and get file status. So for the storage system, we usually found that like if, if uh, even you just read a really small file, the read probably really quick, but to able to read that small file, you need to have at least three metadata calls. So consider you are reading someone, something like image now with 1.3 million of files, maybe the read call is 1 million and then the metadata call can be go out to four to five million times. And that is a huge rate for the storage system. They may be under heavy load or they maybe give you bad latency. And that's it for our talk. I think we still have several minutes to answer any question. And feel free to scan the QR code if you have any follow-up question. And we have all the engineers on our Slack channel. And I will have other like uh, meet us and also like learning materials on the line. Thanks so much. Any question? Thanks.